This is not an MSX. It's a Nintendo Entertainment System, so why is it here? It's a baseline, a comfort zone. For many American gamers in particular, this is the furthest back in time they are willing to go. Older hardware is often judged based on its NES-related incarnations. Perhaps Contra or Mega Man for DOS is used to judge old PC games. They are bad games and are a far cry from what classic PC gaming has to offer. Better that you check out Space Quest 3 or maybe Commander Keen. Don't use low-effort arcade or NES ports as a measuring stick. Ask a retro gamer about the MSX computer and they will say it's a computer that has Vampire Killer, Metal Gear, and bad scrolling. Two NES counterparts plus a stereotype. The MSX has much more to offer. If you haven't heard of the MSX, it's a computer standard that was created in Japan in the early 1980s. It helped unite various manufacturers on which components they would use inside their computers. Regardless of if a system was purchased from Panasonic, Sony, Sanyo, Casio, Yamaha, Philips, Daewoo, or others, MSX consumers could purchase and run software they knew would be compatible with their machine. The standard spans four generations, the MSX, MSX2, MSX2+, Plus, and the MSX Turbo R. These four are oftentimes grouped together and called the MSX. Vampire Killer is for the MSX2. Metal Gear, the same. Let's examine the generations of MSX hardware. I'll list the CPU, RAM, and graphics chips used for each generation and place an emphasis on scrolling and sprites. We'll omit the internal ROM details and a few additional topics will get their own section. My hope is that you will finish the video with more knowledge of the MSX than when you started. The first generation, or MSX1 as the community calls it, runs on a 3.58 MHz Z80A processor. The Sega Master System, the ColecoVision, the ZX Spectrum, many systems used the Z80. It was everywhere when the MSX was standardized, so it made sense to use it. Typical RAM and kilobytes on these machines might be 16, 32, or 64. Some even had 128. Additional RAM could be added via cartridge if it was needed. RAM isn't something console gamers think about, aside from perhaps an N64 game that asks for the expansion pack. Computer gamers, in contrast, are well aware of the need for more RAM. Konami's Salamander is an MSX1 game that requires 16K of RAM and will therefore run on almost all MSX machines. I'll reference Salamander a lot throughout this video. Let's move to graphics, an important focal point for the first generation of MSX computers. The Texas Instruments TMS9918 is used as the Video Display Processor, or VDP, for the MSX1 and is paired with 16K of VRAM. This family of chips was used across many different systems. The Sega SG-1000, the ColecoVision, the TI-9994 and 994A, for example. Several variations of the TI-VDP family as well as compatible clones were used inside MSX1 machines. The VDP has several modes available. MSX Basic refers to them as screen modes. MSX1 games typically use screen 2. Graphics are tile-based. Patterns can be used multiple times to assemble a screen's worth of information. With graphics present, the next question is, what about scrolling? The MSX1 lacks hardware-based scrolling. Scrolling is still possible, programmers just have to donate CPU time to it. As far as visual appeal is concerned, the results may vary. Chunky block-by-block -block scrolling is a characteristic most associate with the MSX1. It is certainly present, but perhaps not as prevalent as most people think. Salamander scrolling is chunky. It's a good example of a familiar game that fits the MSX scrolling stereotype. The environment scrolls 8 pixels at a time at regular intervals. Star Force is a painful example of MSX1 scrolling. I imagine something like this is what most of you imagine whenever you think about scrolling on the system. But some MSX1 games find a way to dedicate enough CPU resources so they can have smooth scrolling. Exoid Z is one rather impressive example that uses some crafty techniques to provide a smooth scrolling experience. Theseus, which looks like Atari's vector-based arcade game Major Havoc, scrolls in four directions and does so quite well. Slow the game down and you can see the small iterations in scrolling that occur as new frames arrive. The speed at which a game scrolls can control how jerky it feels to the player. Xanic AI's speed changes throughout gameplay. The slower speeds feel chunky while the faster speeds feel just a bit smoother. How often a background updates and how many pixels it moves with each update help determine how the scrolling feels to the player. Pitfall 2 seems to scroll just fine on the MSX1. River Raid scrolling is so smooth that it may have you wondering whether or not this footage is from an MSX game. On the subject of graphics, let's talk about sprite limitations. Screen 2 can show up to 32 sprites on the screen at once, but only 4 sprites per horizontal line of pixels. Each sprite is made up of pixels that are either a single color or transparent. The player ship in Salamander, for example, is composed of two sprites. One is the shade of blue and a second adds the white highlights. 
Half the available sprites for a given scan line are lost if both of the ship's sprites are present on that line. How does Salamander follow the rules? The first wave of enemies arrives as one long string. They are not sprites, they are background tiles. The remaining sprites on a line that contains the player's ship can be used for additional enemies or explosions. With a limit of four sprites per line, prioritization can get a little tricky. Here we see the entire white sprite of a player's ship as well as a large chunk of two enemies dropped since the four sprites for this range of horizontal lines are used by the blue ship sprite plus three enemies. A couple of frames later, most of the ship is dropped, leaving behind only a small part of the white ship sprite. Numbering the sprites used within these three ranges shows that the four sprites per line rule is very real and this entire sequence happens about that fast. Salamander constantly prioritizes which four sprites are used to make up each line of a frame. If we start the game with sprites disabled, you can see just how much gameplay uses background tiles instead of sprites. While many gamers find the chunky scrolling unappealing, Konami was far from lazy when they cranked out Salamander, Gradius, and more on the MSX1. Since both the CPU and VDP were common chips, it was easy to port an arcade game to multiple systems that shared those components. While this sounds like an easy win for consumers, it wasn't always a good thing. A game could be designed to run on the crudest system in a group, and those results served as a baseline when it was ported to other systems with similar hardware. You were at the mercy of how much work the developer wanted to do on dedicated ports for a given computer or console. This meant that a game like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for the NES would receive a port to the ZX Spectrum, and then that port might be used as a launching point to churn out a release for the MSX. I don't know the full history of these two, but they look very similar. Oh no! The MSX has terrible platformers! Look at Turtles! I wouldn't be surprised if experiencing this game on the MSX1 would lead to a false assumption about the overall quality of games available on the MSX platform. At the very least, it might give you a false impression about the limitations of the hardware. The irony here is that TMHT might look like an impressive game for the ZX Spectrum while at the same time look like an abomination on the MSX. Everything is relative. The very same MSX1 hardware can run Maze of Gallius, another platformer that looks a bit more appealing. And of course, there is a slew of homebrew that showcases what can be done on an MSX-1 using only 16K of RAM. Despite these terrible stereotypes based on examples of wince-worthy scrolling and hand-me-down ports, the MSX-1 could pull off games that were both fun and impressive. In 1985, the MSX-2 arrived. Backward compatible with original MSX software, this group of machines tends to easily fall under the MSX umbrella when people mention the system. Vampire Killer, Metal Gear, Metal Gear 2, Snatcher, SD Snatcher, all of these games are for the MSX2. What are the hardware differences versus the MSX1? The Z80 CPU remained and operated at the same clock speed, but the new baseline for RAM was 64K. The VDP was upgraded to a Yamaha V9938, a successor to the 9918. Video RAM jumped from 16K to at least 64K and almost always 128K. Along with the addition of new screen modes, thanks to the new VDP, comes the ability to perform smooth, per-pixel scrolling thanks to a vertical scrolling register, number 23. Aleste 2 uses that register and demonstrates that perhaps the vertical shooter can now make itself at home on the MSX2. Other games made use of this feature, and it certainly went a long way in improving the look and feel of scrolling on the platform. Ah, but MSX2 games did not just stop at vertical scrolling. Horizontal scrolling could be performed thanks to the crafty use of an adjust register. The MSX2 hardware now has the ability to align the image top to bottom and left to right. This was exploited to help create smooth, horizontal scrolling. I'll use Basic's set adjust function to demonstrate. Watch. I can offset the screen location by specifying X and Y coordinates. Changing the X coordinate to the minimum value of minus 7 moves the screen as far left as the adjustment allows. An X coordinate of plus 8 moves it as far to the right as it can go. By using control register 18, programmers can shift the screen by as little as one pixel at a time inside this 16 pixel range to assist with scrolling. Space Manbo is one game that does this. The graphics are drawn and the register is used to move them to the left a desired number of pixels for a new frame. The same operation happens for the next frame and so on until the adjustment is out of room. At this point, the software resets the position of the viewable area by moving it all the way to the right, while simultaneously offsetting the graphics and sprites, so the next frame lines up as expected. Graphics on the far left drop off, a new column of graphics is added to the right, and the process can now repeat over and over. 
At game speed, the borders appear to alternate in a TikTok-like manner as part of this back-and-forth movement. Govelius 2 on the MSX2 uses this technique for its platforming areas. The signature alternating is present on both the left and right sides. Psycho World is one example of a game that elected to allocate some of its sprites as black squares to mask the sides of the screen and hide the TikTok effect. Fortunately, the new screen modes 4 through 8 allow up to 8 sprites to coexist on a given horizontal line, double that of the previous screen modes from the MSX1. This makes it a lot easier for Psycho World to allocate two sprites per line as black squares. If I disable the sprites, the black squares on the sides are eliminated and this lets you see the TikTok effect in action as I move our invisible heroine left and right. Scrolling options for both the horizontal and vertical directions improved considerably with the arrival of the MSX2 despite the fact only the vertical direction received full hardware functionality. Since up to eight sprites can exist on a single line, developers can add more detail to their art. This rendition of Goemon facing right is created using one sprite for the head and eyes, a second for the face and body, a third for the skin, and a fourth for the red clothing. Four sprites, three colors. At most, Goemon uses three of the total eight sprites for the few lines that contain his outline, skin, and clothing. If you examine some other sprites, such as those from Psycho World or Metal Gear 2, they are quite colorful. This is thanks to a new feature that makes use of a bitwise or operation. What does that mean? Let's say you have a palette with three colors, red, blue, and orange, and they correspond to the palette indices one, two, and three. If I have two sprites that are just blocks, a color one red block and a color two blue block, and I place them on top of each other, which color do we see? The answer depends on the priority values for the sprites, but there is another option. Take a look at the binary values for the palette IDs 1 and 2. If I OR these two values together by each bit, what do I get? When comparing 1s and zeros using OR, a minimum of a single 1 in the comparison means the result is 1. Therefore, if I OR the values of each column, I get 0, 0, 1, 1, which is the binary value for 3. These new screen modes that use Sprite Mode 2 give programmers the option to OR the palette colors together when stacking sprites. This being the case, stacking these two sprites together yields orange. Yeah, the result of performing a bitwise OR on the binary values of 1 and 2. In addition to this, a sprite can now use a different color for each horizontal line of graphics in its pattern. Returning to Psycho World, the two pairs of sprites that comprise the playable character's body look like this. Combine them and you have a character consisting of five total colors with as many as three colors per horizontal line, yet have only exhausted two of the eight total sprites allowed for any given line. The results arrive thanks to the combination of stacked sprites where one sprite uses a color in the same place the other uses transparency, or a new palette color appears thanks to a bitwise OR performed on the stacked colors. The possibility of having different combinations per line makes artistic craftsmanship of the resulting combined sprite all that much more impressive. In Metal Gear 2, Snake is made up of six colors that result from the combination of, once again, only two sprites on a given horizontal line. I am a strong believer in the idea that limitation breeds creativity and I really appreciate the links developers went to in order to churn out sprites such as these. If you develop retro games today using modern hardware, try placing restrictions on yourself like those of the sprites found on the MSX2. It may help your game feel a bit more authentic. Speaking of palette colors on the MSX, did you notice that the earlier footage of Salamander had inconsistent colors across the various captures? The colors may look different from each other depending on which MSX machine you use to run a game, or more specifically, depending on which VDP revision or clone is used inside the system. In late 1988, the MSX2 Plus computers hit the market. Their CPU is compatible with the aforementioned Z80 and runs at the same clock speed. Some machines, like the WSX from Panasonic, which is my machine of choice, have the option to clock up to 5.37 MHz. All official models of the MSX2 Plus released in Japan came with 64K of RAM. The VDP was updated to a Yamaha V9958. Among the benefits of this chip were additional screen modes that provided an increased color count and hardware-based horizontal scrolling using registers 26 and 27. This would be a good time to mention software written to take advantage of different MSX hardware. 
Just as a PC game can provide support for multiple machine configurations, some MSX games take advantage of superior hardware when detected. Space Manbo runs on an MSX2 using the border flipping method. Run the same cartridge in an MSX2 Plus and the game uses the new horizontal scroll registers to provide a smoother experience. Golvelius 2 also takes advantage of smooth horizontal scrolling and jumps from using the pattern-based Screen 4 mode to the bitmap-based Screen 5. This also provides a nice graphical upgrade. Compare the green background areas from the two examples. Speaking of the graphics for Govelius 2, the opening cinematic of the game uses different screen modes depending on if it is run on an MSX2 or MSX2 Plus or higher. The Screen 8 mode with a maximum of 256 colors is used on the MSX2, while Screen 12 with a maximum of just over 19,000 colors is used on an MSX2 Plus and up. As far as games that arrived that were exclusive to the MSX2 Plus, there weren't that many. F1 Spirit 3D Special is a pretty good example of a game that uses the new scrolling abilities to pull off some impressive effects. Konami also added a feature that allowed you to connect two MSX2 Plus machines together via controller port B so you could race a friend. As we head into the 90s, our fourth and final system is the MSX Turbo R. Panasonic produced two models of the Turbo R for consumers, the FSA1 ST and the FSA1 GT. The Turbo R brought with it a very noteworthy change in the form of an updated CPU, an R800 processor running at 7.16 MHz. Some say it clocks like a Z80 at 28.6 MHz as it takes about a fourth of the clock ticks to execute instructions versus the original Z80. An MSX engine chip with an embedded Z80 clone clocked at 3.58 MHz is used for backward compatibility. RAM is a simple story, 256K for the ST and 512K for the GT. VDP is the same as the MSX2 Plus, the Yamaha V9958. The Turbo saw a limited number of games that took advantage of its hardware. Frey, for example, has several enhancements versus the separate MSX2 and 2 Plus release. The Turbo R is quite impressive. It is too bad that it arrived during the sunset of the MSX platform in terms of mass market retail. Fortunately, the ongoing era of homebrew has helped it show off what it can do. We'll dive into homebrew a bit later. Let's talk about media. The MSX has three primary forms of media, cassettes, cartridges, and floppy disks. Cassettes are an affordable way to distribute games and are known for very long load times. The format is perhaps stereotyped as delivering cheap ZX Spectrum ports, but don't write off cassette games. There are some fun ones, such as Fruit Panic and Master of the Lamps. Cartridges deliver a large number of heavy hitters to the MSX gaming library and can also be used as a means to expand the MSX hardware. Most MSX machines have two cartridge slots and Konami took advantage of this. Placing the Konami game you want to play in slot 1 and adding a second Konami game in slot 2 could result in a few Easter eggs. For example, Gradius in slot 1 with Twin B in slot 2 turns your ship into a Twin B and the energy pods are bells. Likewise, Gradius 2 in slot 1 and Penguin Adventure in slot 2 turns your ship into a penguin and the energy pods are now fish. Konami would later take these ideas and create a game called Parodius. While some combinations were funny, others were helpful. Gradius 2 in slot 1 with Maze of Gallius in slot 2 lets you activate a new backup power option. Dying in Gradius 2 will result in a loss of any power-ups that have been collected. With Maze of Gallius on board, backup can be activated after dying to bring back everything you just lost, a game changer for many of us. Salamander has a very interesting combo. Gradius 2 in slot 2 adds an extra stage so you can actually finish the game. Yeah, to get the good ending in Salamander you need both games. The Gradius 2 cartridge is not just an unlocking mechanism, as Salamander uses the extra graphics contained in the Gradius 2 cartridge to render the final stage. Konami had several other combinations aside from the ones mentioned here, but let's get back to media. Floppy disks offer a way to provide a large amount of data to MSX machines at the expense of load times, although loading data from floppy is not nearly as bad as loading from cassette. Most commercial games that use them were designed for an MSX2 or higher. Some forms of media weren't used as much as others. For instance, the Hudson Soft B card, which is a precursor to the Hue card for the PC Engine, could be used with a special interface cartridge to play games.
Laserdisc was also used as a medium for several games. Some MSX machines could interface with the Laserdisc player, and about a dozen LD games were released for the MSX from 1984 to 1986. This predates the Pioneer Laser Active by almost a decade. Now, let's talk about sound. When it comes to the MSX, the sound can be a bit overwhelming. Sound options include a programmable sound generator, or PSG, all four MSX incarnations had this. Cartridges with FM sound, including the OPL1-based MSX Audio, which also included ADPCM playback functionality, and the OPLL-based MSX Music. Wavetable sound from the Sound Creative chip, or SCC, found inside cartridges of several Konami games. A MIDI interface to onboard external music modules. Additional FM sound including OPL4, OPM, OPNA, and OPNB. The list goes on and even includes a SID-based sound source. Did I mention the MSX is a computer? Expansion comes with the territory. Let's listen to a few samples. Speaking of expansion, slot expanders are a useful accessory to help overcome the limitation of only two cartridge slots found in most MSX machines. It makes it easy to combine, say, a flashcard containing your favorite homebrew with any desired sound or video cartridges of choice. Wait, did I say video? Yes. Not only can the MSX gain sound options, it can also use added video chips. The Yamaha V9990 can be added to your MSX via the cartridge port thanks to products such as the Sunrise GFX9000. It brings higher resolutions, more colors, greater sprite limits, and more. Now let's look at some homebrew. If you want to know just how much a computer or console can do, take a look at its homebrew offerings. The MSX does not disappoint. You may even see some familiar faces. In fact, perhaps there are a few games out there that look very similar to other games you may have played. The first homebrew game I played was Pleasure Hearts. Before I really started to examine the full library of MSX games, this one was quite the eye-opener, and it still is after 20 years. Massive firepower, huge explosions, and a scoring system that is ridiculously high make Pleasure Hearts really stand out. Have you ever played Ghost 1.0? Did you know that the same developer made a prequel called Ghost for the MSX-1? You want an exploration platformer? You got it.
If you've ever played Capcom's King of Dragons arcade beat-em-up action RPG, you might be interested in Myths and Dragons, a homebrew game that runs on an MSX2 or higher, requires the V9990 VDP for its graphical work, and supports multiple sound chips, including the OPL4. Finally, let's talk about patches. Patches are an underrated gift from the MSX community. We are not just talking about bug fixes or new translations, and those fixes and translations are most welcome, but also about new features for existing games. Let's start with something familiar, Vampire Killer. The MSX2 release is different than Castlevania on the NES. It is an exploratory game, whereas the NES incarnation is linear. Vampire Killer was released in 1986 before Konami incorporated their SCC chip into their games for improved sound. While the typical keyboard controls for many games would use the space bar for the primary action and the N or M keys for the secondary action, Vampire Killer assigned the secondary action to the up arrow. An attempt to go up some stairs feels like you're in a bouncy castle if you press up outside of the stair boundary. This was easier on a two-button MSX joystick as a second button was used to jump instead of the up direction. F1 pauses the game. F2 loads a map of the area. Some visual issues can occur at the top of the screen. The game has region detection and loads a different title screen when played on a European MSX2 versus Japanese MSX2. European systems run the game at 50 Hz and the speed is inconsistent. The enhancements and fixes now available thanks to the community include automatically setting the VDP to a 60 Hz refresh so the European machines can play the game at the correct speed, dynamic V-Sync timing routines to reduce slowdowns, better support for turbo CPUs, a fix for the graphical glitches that happen at the top of the screen. Enhanced cycling of sprites so any flickering that occurs will be smoother. And updates for the controls. The keyboard controls have been changed, so the player can now use the M or N keys for jump, and up is used only to climb the stairs. Meanwhile, not only can a Genesis controller be hooked up to an MSX thanks to a proper adapter, but the gamepad is now supported in Vampire Killer. This means that Start will pause the game and the A button is used to access the map. Pretty convenient for a game that only supports a two-button gamepad. All of these changes help add some polish to Vampire Killer, and some people have pushed the changes even further. One patch adds SCC sound support, so having a cartridge in the machine with an SCC chip lets the music move from the stock PSG to a new wavetable arrangement. And there is even a patch to make the game linear and provide a more familiar layout to the gameplay. It even has a title screen to match the changes. But perhaps one example of a game that has some jaw-dropping changes would be... Yep, Salamander. Salamander's changes include the aforementioned dynamic V-Sync and turbo fix, a ripple laser fix, Three, two, one, zero. voice support if a second SCC chip is made available to the game. This includes three voice sets, a default from the arcade game, and a male and female voice from Gradius Gaiden. Voices can be changed by pausing the game with F1 and selecting the desired voice with F2, F3, or F4. Okay. Okay. And the male and female voices will be assigned to the appropriate vessel in dual play mode. Three, two, one. Three, two, one, zero. Pausing the game and pressing S cycles three levels of gameplay speed. Three. Pausing the game and pressing P cycles three different palette modes. One, two, three. The Gradius 2 ROM has been integrated into the patch to provide the full ending for the game. Oh, and by the way, the game now has smooth scrolling.
The update requires an MSX2 or higher, and a list of fixes and options available can be accessed by holding H while booting the system. It is absolutely amazing that these dedicated people have been able to enhance the game this much. And don't forget, I've only mentioned patches for two games. There are many more patches to be found. So, feeling overwhelmed? If you are, then mission accomplished. The point of this video was to help boost your knowledge of the MSX family as a computer platform and perhaps discover that it can do a lot more than you thought it could. I only scratched the surface. This was just an appetizer of what is out there. Thanks for watching.